Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I changed the title a little bit. I thought it was a little bit too challenging and also maybe a bit more geared towards solutions. So air pollution, climate change, hotspot in the Mediterranean. And also my work is also focusing on the Middle East. Um, this word, by the way, of uh, climate change hotspot was uh, was proposed by Filippo Giorgi here more than 10 years ago. He's at ICTP here. And uh, showing that the Mediterranean is actually, from a global perspective, a climate change hotspot. And I'll talk about this in terms of heat extremes. Uh, a little bit about uh, windblown dust, which is also something that is very specific for the region. We also find that it is increasing. Uh, pollution trends we can see from space. Uh, atmospheric chemistry and climate modeling, tropospheric ozone and particulate matter, which are actually the two components that are mostly related to health issues. Uh, also, a few words on uh, how the mineral dust is changing its properties under the influence of air pollution. And then the main part of my talk will be on global fine particulates and health impacts, and also try to attribute the sources. So first on uh, this um, climate change hotspot, if you would look into, say, data or model output for the region that is indicated here, uh, so this is not only Mediterranean, but also North Africa, Middle East, you will find that the, glo the, the annual global mean is not very particularly different from the rest of the globe. It doesn't stand out very much in terms of the annual average. As you can see here to the left, the upper left is, um, is the uh, mid-century in winter, so December, January, February. This is the end of the century. This is the mid-century in the summer, and this is end of the century in the summer. And this is according to an IPCC scenario. And um, uh, as you know, what is being predicted or being believed that will happen unless something very um, strict will, uh, will be undertaken in terms of emissions that roughly by the middle of this century we will be at two degrees warming. And you can see to the left, by the middle of the century, this is actually what the models predict. This is the ensemble average of about almost 30 climate models that have been used for the IPCC assessment. And then if you look to the right, you look at the, the summer, you see that you, the colors are suddenly turning red. So winter climate change is not very special in this region, at least not in terms of temperature, but summer temperatures are increasing very strongly. And we also see this in meteorological data. Heat extremes are increasing strongly in this region. And that, of course, is something to worry about because this is a region that's already quite hot. So if the summers are hot and getting so much hotter, and of course, if this scenario comes true by the end of the century, we're talking about something like more than six degrees uh, in a region where uh, annual average or summer averages are already close to 40. So this is really an important issue. What you also see in this um, slide is the stippling here and the, uh, the hatching, and this indicates robustness. And robustness is a measure of how the models, to what degree the models agree. And um, these results are extremely robust. That means that all the climate models agree on these, on these projections, um, at least for temperature. And if you look at, uh, for these four regions that have been defined to look at meteorological data, if you look at the climate calculations and compare them with the reference period, which was from 1986 to 2005, you can see that the models really do well in terms of reproducing the data. This is the seasonal cycle for these four regions. And you see that especially in summer, the models are spot on. In winter, there are some differences, and this is mostly related, I believe, to the fact that the models have more problems in dealing with precipitation than they have with temperature. And this is shown here. This is the same type of panels, but now for precipitation in terms of percentage change. And you can see that there is some robustness here around the Mediterranean, where it is uh, projected that the precipitation will decrease. And uh, in, in parts of Africa, it will be increasing. This is most relevant here. In the summer, there is not much rain anyway in this area. So these percentage changes do not have a lot of meaning. 
And it's also predicted that, for example, in the southern part of Saudi Arabia in the Sahel, uh, uh, precipitation will be increasing. And actually, these things are coupled because the question is also, why is this a climate change hotspot? And the, one of the main uh, reasons is, is that it's also dry. Because if you warm a region, it's like when you cook water, evaporation will counterbalance the warming by, by removing heat through evaporation. But if there is no water, then this mechanism doesn't work. So this is basically a sort of a, a desert heating amplification mechanism. And the reason why the Mediterranean, Mediterranean is so strongly affected in general is also because the region is becoming much drier. This is also something that comes out of climate models and also is being confirmed by meteorological data, is that the region is becoming drier. So the soils are drying up, they lose their capability of cooling by evaporation, and by this mechanism, this, uh, this, this causes a warming amplification. And you also see this in heat extremes, and these are four measures. This is uh, cool nights going down, and you can see that the measurement data are in blue here, and the model projections are, the averages are in black, and the, uh, the ranges, the, st the um, standard deviation is in light blue, and the maximum and minimum values are here indicated in light blue. And you can see cool nights going down, warm nights going up, also co coincident with the measurements, cool days going down, and here warm days, so these are the warmest days, and the hottest days, actually, you can see of over 40. And the, and the very hot days are close to 60, or even going up further. So these are really extremely hot temperatures that can become quite threatening for this region. Now, a few words on the dust. Uh, uh, this is also something that is quite peculiar in, 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 in at least part of the region. Uh, these are dust, or at least there's aerosol trends based on uh, MODIS is a satellite uh, instrument that has been measuring uh, since 2000, and you can see here the trend between 2000 and 2015. And you can see again in the Middle East, there is quite a large increase of the dust, and the stippling indicates uh, the significance of the trends. Uh, let's focus a bit more on the Middle East. And here we see, this is Saudi Arabia, uh, or the Arabian Peninsula, and uh, Eastern Mediterranean and Cyprus where I also work, and you can see there's a very high statistical significance in increasing uh, the, um, uh, the concentration of aerosol particles over this region. And this is actually dust, we also, because we also know this from other, uh, from other uh, information. And um, one of the things that was found in this study is that there is a relationship between warming and dust. Because when you warm, most of the world, especially over the sea, you will have more evaporation, and that keeps the relative humidity almost constant. So higher temperatures, relative humidity stays constant. But if there is no evaporation, then the relative humidity goes down. And actually, if the relative humidity goes down, that, that promotes the mobilization of the dust. Now, this is only one of theories here, because there has been a drought in Syria and Iraq for the last, since about 2000. But of course, many other things have also happened in this region. So we're not entirely sure that this is one region. But we think that there is a, a feedback between climate warming in dry regions and dust mobilization. Now, the Middle East is an interesting place, uh, as you know. And um, this is on air pollution. It also has a few advantages, uh, one of them being that there is almost no clouds in the summer and very few clouds in other times of the year so that we can see very clearly from space what the concentrations are, for example, of nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide. And you can see that here, and this is a result over 10 years of a satellite instrument called OMI, the Ozone Monitoring Instrument, between 2005 and 2014. And you can see the NO2 over the cities mostly. And uh, NO2 also has natural sources, but in the Middle East it almost only has anthropogenic sources. It comes from fossil fuel combustion, so we have traffic, uh, power generation, etc. So you can very clearly see cities in satellite observations of NO2. 
And since we have measurements since two, 2005, we can also look at trends in these things. And uh, so what we see, for example, from 2005 to 2010, that there is a very strong upward trend in most of the region. And you can see that, again, in these urban, urbanized areas, industrial areas, Cairo, but not in Athens, because in Greece in 2008, a uh, financial crisis contributed to the fact that uh, nitrogen dioxide co uh, concentrations went down. But in much of the rest of the region, up to 2010, the concentrations were increasing. Now, if we take the next step between 2010 and 2014, things look really very different. And this has to do with many special things that are happening in the Middle East. The trend over Athens has continued. We have, you know, we have a political turnover in Cairo associated also with, uh, in Egypt, with, uh, with strongly decreasing pollution. We have decreasing pollution in some areas over the, in the Persian Gulf area or Arabian Gulf, depending on your perspective. We have still increasing in some part of Iraq, but you can see in the area where the ISIS has become active, the concentrations are going down. We have negative trends after 2010 in Syria, but positive trends in Lebanon. You know, people fleeing from, from, uh, from Syria to Lebanon, taking their cars, etc. You can actually see that from space. And also in, uh, in Iran, this, uh, there was a, a conflict, uh, you remember, on, uh, on the use of nuclear power and uh, the, the suspicion of building a nuclear, uh, nuclear bomb. And after uh, 2010, uh, the uh, international community strengthened the, uh, the, uh, the embargo on Iran, and you can see that this had economic impact, but also on air pollution. And if we take it one year further now, so we can follow this from year to year, we now also see that in Lebanon, the trends have become negative. So people are fleeing now also to other areas in Turkey and in Europe, actually, we see negative emissions in the entire area where the ISIS is active, continuing negative emissions in Iran, continuing negative emissions here. And we have the same to some degree for SO2. The satellite instrument is not as sensitive for SO2 as it is for NO2. But since the area is, uh, is very accessible to, air, to uh, satellite measurements, we see here SO2 concentrations over the Persian Gulf. And uh, you can see that there is um, quite, uh, qu quite a high concentrations in this area, which has to do with the processing of fossil fuels, but also shipping. Shipping is a big source of SO2. And if we look at trends now, we can see up to 2010, we had positive trends in most of the area, so strongly positive trends here. But now if we take the years after 2010, we see very negative trends. This is upquake. This is the largest oil processing uh, facility in the world, in Saudi Arabia, where trends have become slightly negative, but the largest negative trend is here. This is a terminal uh, from Iran where oil exports are being concentrated. So ships go there, are being filled with oil, and you can see the very negative trend is simply due to the fact that the ships that take the oil were no longer taking oil uh, into the world. So this was also... a a consequence of the oil embargo that hit uh, Iran. And if you take it one year further, actually, Iran was not sleeping because they also have gas. And this is a, a gas processing uh, unit. And the natural gas contains quite a lot of sulfur. And they take the sulfur out before they liquefy it and, and, and transport it. And you can actually see that after 2014, the Iranians have become very active. In, uh, in, in exporting gas, because that was not hit by the embargo. Anyway, the bottom line is you can see a lot of things from space, and uh, since we do not have emission data from this region, we can use these space measurements to, uh, to evaluate at least the trends in these emissions. Now, I want to put these things a little bit together using models, uh, atmospheric chemistry and aerosol and climate modeling, so you can see here things like aerosols and oxidants, greenhouse gases causing radiative forcings, change in the surface temperature, but also there are many feedbacks. On clouds, for example, there are also direct relationships between aerosol particles and clouds, and we try to evaluate these things with models. 
Now, I do not have the time to go into very much detail, but I just want to show you a few things that we do with these models, and actually we also use them to uh, address health impacts. So one of the results here is that uh, we can see that from the model results that the ozone concentrations are very high. The name of the model is EMAC. It's surface ozone in the summer, June, July, August. And you can see this entire area is very uh, conspicuous in terms of high ozone. It's also in California and some parts of the United States, but you see the concentrations here over this area are even higher. And they're definitely higher than the air quality standard. And you can see here the, the wind arrow. So actually this is pollution being transported from Europe and also local pollution, added pollution from shipping. And here you see the hotspot actually of ozone pollution related to fossil energy use and fossil energy production. And ozone is actually quite relevant for human health. Here we can see over Europe what the model is doing. So we have these measurement stations here, and we can see we can follow it in time. This is the, uh, the, this, the, uh, the spread, and actually the model, although there are some discrepancies if you look closely, but you can see that the model can do this pretty well, even the spread. The other thing is aerosols. So how well do models do aerosols? So we see here aerosols uh, from, uh, at, uh, measured from a satellite at a radiation uh, wavelength of uh, two, 550 nanometers, which is in the middle of the visible light where the extinction is most important. And you can see here the model and here the satellite data. And here's the aerosol optical depth. This is the solar radiation extinction by aerosol particles. And here you can see the same, but this is now for 10 micrometers. And this actually highlights the dust because the dust particles are bigger and they scatter and absorb solar radiation in higher wavelengths. And you can see at least qualitatively that the model is doing a fairly good job. And of course, we have done a lot to study the behavior and improve it according to models, uh, to, uh, to measurements, but there's no time to go into this. And one of the things that you can calculate with these models is, for example, the radiative forcing of aerosol particles. And here you see that aerosol particles is mostly pollution, is mostly negative, so causing a cooling forcing of the climate. So we have this is in watts per square meter, but that aerosols cause a warming over the, uh, over the deserts. And this has to do also with the surface albedo. If the surface alb albedo is reflective, like over deserts and over ice, then the particles are usually warming. And if the surface albedo is dark, so more absorbi absorbing solar radiation, you see that, this, that, the, um, that the, uh, the forcing is mostly negative, causing a cooling. And this is also very, very clearly the case over the Mediterranean, because it is a polluted area, and it, of course, also has a dark uh, sea surface. So this is an area that's also quite important in terms of climate forcing which has been confirmed also by direct measurements. A few things about the dust and the interactions between dust and air pollution. This is something we've started working on recently. And this now appears to be a quite important impact. And uh, unfortunately, it makes climate models more complicated, but also more interesting, I find. So because the dust particles are usually particles that do not have a lot of uh, soluble material in them. So that means that they do not absorb water very efficiently. They can actually physically adsorb a little water, but not much through absorption. But then if the particles become polluted, when covered by, by, by air pollution, then they start up taking up water because the air pollution is hygroscopic. So air pollution like ammonium sulfide, ammonium nitrate, and there's also minerals in the aerosol that react with, these, uh, sulf with sulfuric acid and nitric acid in the atmosphere that are then being mobilized. And these are very hygroscopic. So the particles actually can grow and take up more air pollution. And ultimately, they can become little droplets. And there are a few things that are important about this. It's firstly, be they become more scattering. So the aerosols are becoming more white. And you can actually see this. If you look at polluted dust in the atmosphere, it is white. And if it is clean dust, it is more like yellowish, depending on the color of the, of the dust. 
And there is another thing is that these particles are much more efficient in influencing the formation of cloud droplets. And uh, it has a number of effects on climate that are partly counterbalancing. And uh, let me first show you some model results here in the Mediterranean area. These are measurements, the black dots, and the model results are, are in blue here. And uh, so this is in, uh, in Italy, in, 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 uh, in Israel, in Cyprus, in Turkey, and in, um, and in Greece. And um, you can see that the model is doing this fairly well. But if we use the same model to look at the impact of the aging, as we call it, of the dust, so the air pollution influence on the dust, we see that the dust removal becomes much more efficient if we include this process. If you do not include it, you see a very much less efficient removal. So the particles become little droplets. They become more scattering. They become whiter, so they become more cooling. But they're also being removed more efficiently because they are becoming more efficient cloud condensation nuclei so that they can actually rain out. So there are a number of effects that we are currently studying. And if you would like to know more about this, please contact me because there is not much time to go into it. But I just wanted to mention this is an area that is of increasing importance, not only for climate, but also for health impacts, because the dust particles are interacting with pollutants that may be more toxic than the particles are when they are being emitted from, from the deserts directly. Now, a few more words on the model. So here you see the column integral modeled black carbon particulate organic uh, matter, uh, dust, as we have already seen, and sea salt. So these are the sort of particles that we are trying to model, and also their interactions. Uh, there's also inorganics like sulfate and nitrate, ammonium, and you can see the maxima in parts of the world where you probably expect them. And actually, water is also important. This is mostly important for climate, not so much for health. But if the particles become more hygroscopic and take up water, as I mentioned, also for the dust, then they become uh, uh, more scattering. So they be actually the air pollution impact on, or the, the water uptake of the, of the air pollution and the interactions with water are quite important for the climate forcing calculations of aerosol particles. Actually, if you take an aerosol particle over the Mediterranean and you could analyze it as it was under ambient conditions, you would find that water is the main component of the particle. And uh, the second uh, most important is probably like sulfate and organics. Here's some comparison for different continents. And you can see these are the observations and these are the model results. And you can see the ideal line on one to one is perfect agreement, but there is agreement roughly within a factor of two or so, which is for aerosol uh, calculations, quite good. Here are some more comparisons for, this is a network in the United States for nitrate, ammonium, sulfate. This is in Europe and this is in Asia. You can see the toughest one to do actually is nitrate because it interacts with all kinds of other components in the aerosol. So if you have, for example, more ammonia, it will trap uh, nitric acid as nitrate in the particles. So this is a tough one to do, but I think this is as as reasonable as you can expect for a model. Here's another one. These are background stations. Background stations we do fairly well. Actually, pollution stations are more difficult to do also because of the resolution of the model, because near pollution sources you have strong gradients, and these models typically have a rather coarse resolution. So now I want to get more into health and also see, show you how these things all link together. So you have emissions from high volatility gases that are being oxidized into lower volatility gases, making secondary particles. We have primary particles like particulate organic aerosols, black carbon and sea salt and dust, and they can actually interact with the pollution and then uh, become what we call aged aerosols. Then they affect the op optical properties of the particles, making uh, influence in climate, or they can influence clouds that influence climate. Ecosystems can be because of nutrients. For example, the dust contains uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, and this can be mobilized by air pollution. Uh, these, are in, uh, these are trapped in, 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 in minerals, 
So this can actually also influence ecosystems. But now I want to focus a little bit more on the air quality aspect of it. So all of these things are clearly linked. And I also think that if we want to achieve solutions, we have to integrate the entire picture and not just focus on one particular one. Because if you, sometimes if you solve one problem, you aggravate another problem. So what's the problem here? The problem is actually mostly fine particulates. Uh, this is PM 2.5. So these are particular, uh, for, uh, small uh, aerosol particles with a diameter smaller than 2.5 micrometers. The satellite cannot measure this directly, but it has been derived from satellite measurements. And you can immediately see the problem here, because the WHO air quality guideline is 10 micrograms per cubic meter. And if you overlay this map, this is annual averages, with a population map, you can very easily see, straightforward, very, uh, very clearly see, that more than 90% of all people on this globe are being exposed to, to air pollution that exceeds the air quality guideline of the WHO. And actually, I will be showing you that this guideline is actually a very optimistic one. So this is the problem, actually, is that 7, mil 7 billion people are exposed to uh, pollution levels that cause illness. Now, how do we do this? How do we derive illness from, uh, from, from satellite maps or from, from, uh, from, from global um, uh, model calculations? And we follow here the method of the global burden of disease. This is sort of like the IPCC of the, uh, the disease community. And we, and we calculated the excess mortality by taking this, the baseline mortality for any particular disease. And diseases that are relevant are listed here. So we have ischemic heart disease that leads to heart attacks. We have cerebrovascular disease leading to strokes. We have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, and lower respiratory tract infections that can, by the way, also affect children. So these are the five disease categories that are uh, have been proven to be related to air pollution. And uh, the mortality is calculated by using the baseline mortality from these diseases, multiplying that with the attributable fraction and the population. Now, the attributable fraction is based on epidemiological studies that study the relative risk, is that um, the attributable fraction tells us which part of the number of people that die from a certain disease can be attributed to air pollution. And this has been, as I said, taken from epidemiological studies. Then we need population. This is the relative risk I just mentioned. And then, of course, we have the uh, pollution coming in, ozone and PM2.5. So we use this to calculate uh, premature mortality and related to these diseases. Now, a few more words on this attributable fraction. This is on uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And you can see here the PM2.5 concentration. And here is the attributable fraction. And you can see it goes up. And actually, the global burden of disease in 2010 used this curve, and 2015 used this curve, because there are new epidemiological studies coming in that uh, indicate that the uh, values were higher. And what you can see is a number of things. First of all, that the attributable fraction can be quite high. Of course, if the concentrations are getting very, very high, we are getting close to 40%. But what you can also see that there is a nonlinear relationship is that actually when you go down here at lower concentrations, there is a lot to be gained from cleaning up the air. And uh, here, up here, the concentration decrease does something, of course, but you really have to decrease the concentrations quite drastically to really get to clean air. And another thing that you can see here is that the safe threshold changed actually from 7.3 roughly to a little bit more than 4 micrometers. And if we now look at the WHO standard, which is 10 uh, micrograms per cubic meter, you can see that actually there is quite a lot of attributable fraction below this uh, WHO guideline. So it will probably not be very easy in many regions of the world to get below 10 micrograms. But actually, this is something you need to know. If you really want to clean up the air, you need to go even down further. 
And these are some global estimates which are quite in line with the global burden of disease of 2015. The mortality of PM2.5 is almost 4.3 million per year, so more than 4 million people per year. Ozone is 270,000, total more than 4.5 million. So there is a Lancet uh, uh, report on global health and it estimates that um, environmental related, environment related a disease and, and, uh, and mortality is about 9 million per year. So this is poor water, poor air, indoor, indoor air pollution, etc. And you can see half of it is outdoor air pollution, which is a big number. And this is the uncertainty. This is the st statistical uncertainty ranges of the order of plus or minus 30%. I would claim that the actual uncertainty is a little bit larger even, but um, it's still... It, the, the numbers are still large, even if you would assume that we were at the lower part of the uncertainty limit. You can see that the main causes is ischemic heart disease, one and a half million, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cerebrovascular disease leading to stroke, almost a million, and lower respiratory tract infections. And about one third to a half of this is related to children, mostly in low income countries. This is pneumonia being caused by air pollution. And in some countries, children die from pneumonia. Not so much in the Western world, but in Southern Asia and in Africa, this is the case. So some more numbers for you. So this is ischemic heart disease. This is now in percentages here. And so these are basically the numbers I have just given. Ischemic heart disease is the number one, COPD the number two. And you can actually distinguish here uh, between uh, ischemic and uh, hemorrhagic uh, stroke, uh, and uh, this is lower respiratory illness and lung cancer. So actually, these are the sort of diseases you also get from smoking. So I would call this passive outdoor smoking. This is what you can compare it with. And um, now also trying to get more to the sources, also maybe on a country level. If you take these countries together, China, India, Europe and North America, you can explain 67%, two thirds of all the, um, the deaths related to air pollution. And so if you add up these numbers, you get to 67%. And you see the largest fraction is in China and then India. Actually, China is now starting to really control air pollution and in India, the air pollution is going up tremendously, mostly because of the use of coal. And this is uh, Eastern Europe, and this is uh, EU, the European Union Europe, 6%. So together, about 13%. If you look at the per capita, this is quite, was also surprising to me, is that this is North America, this is Europe, India, China, Eastern Europe. So the per capita effect of air pollution on mortality is highest in Eastern Europe, like in Russia and the Ukraine. And this not only has to do with air pollution, but also with the meteorological conditions. Because the meteorological conditions trap the air pollution in the lower part of the atmosphere. There is no monsoon in, uh, in, in the Ukraine or in Russia. And uh, for this reason, uh, air quality in these regions can be quite poor. So let me summarize this. And uh, so mortality attributable to outdoor air pollution is about four and a half million per year. It is the main environmental health risk globally, and it's actually one of the top five health risks, risks overall. So with high blood pressure, diabetes, tobacco smoking, and being overweight, is air pollution. I'm sure that some of you were not aware of this. And it is not that people, when they die from air pollution, use a few weeks of their life. No, they lose 28 years, any person affected on a statistical basis. So, the total number of years of life lost is 120 million per year. And for smoking, it's still a bit larger, six and a half million, but the number of years of life lost is almost the same because children are less affected by smoking and uh, the individual years of life lost for a person who dies from smoking is 24 years. So I think this is a very important message that uh, air pollution can even be worse than smoking. <laughs> of course, depending on how you look at it. 
but it is involuntary because you're exposed to something that you have no control over. If you're a smoker, you have some control yourself. And this is now getting to the sources. Whenever I talk to people about air pollution, the first thing they always say, urban air pollution traffic. That's what people always say. Actually, this is a wrong way of thinking about air pollution because traffic produces nitrogen oxide, for example, but it takes time to make particles or ozone out of the nitrogen oxide. So actually, air pollution is not an urban problem. Maybe because many people live in the urban environment so that they get exposed to poor air pollution, but actually it goes much beyond the urban environment. And for this region, we see, reason, we see that other sources are very important. On a global scale, residential energy use is the largest source of air pollution-related mortality. Agriculture is very important because it produces ammonia, and ammonia catalyzes the formation of particles. Power production, biomass burning, and then, of course, we have natural sources, industry, and traffic. And I'll give two more examples of individual countries that will give you some flavor of the importance. And um, by the way, this was the map of the global yeah, attributable, uh, air pollution attributable death. And this is now the same, this is for all ages, and this is now the, the years of life loss. This is for all ages, and this is for children. And you can see 120 million years of life are lost per year. And you can see the areas, I mean, India and China, Africa, but also Europe, here, northeastern United States. But if you focus on children only, it's 22 million, and it's actually mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and southern Asia. The reason being, as I mentioned earlier, is that these children sometimes die from air pollution, from pneumonia. Uh, actually, in Europe and the United States, children can also get pneumonia, but they typically don't die from it. So these are some more numbers here on uh, uh, years of uh, life lost. Years, I'm not sure if you can read all these countries. The number one with the per capita highest years of life lost in children is Chad. So these are regions also uh, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, which are affected by air pollution that, and who, which are also poor. And this is again the disease categories now in terms of years of life lost. And you can see here this is lung cancer, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and lower respiratory tract infections is, a, is about thir almost 30%. And 11% is, uh, is more than five years old, and 18% is uh, more, uh, more than 50, uh, less than five years old of age. So actually, if you, if you look at it in terms of years of life lost, 18% is related to children. And here you see a summary of the source categories being indicated. The largest or the leading source category, of course, dust is important here. By the way, dust is not all natural. It's very difficult to estimate which part is not natural. But I would say the recent estimates indicate that about 25% of the dust is man-made or human-made. And here you see residential energy use as this one is most important in India and in China, and also here on Java, for example, in Indonesia. Here we have power production and traffic, and here we have biomass burning. So these are the leading source categories of air pollution that lead to mortality. And here's a comparison of two countries, just to show you that it can be really different, uh, even though the pollution effects may be quite similar. This is the United States, where 120,000 people die per year from air pollution. Here you see traffic is much larger than the global average. Residential energy is small. Agriculture is important. Power production, and here bio, uh, biomass burning and natural is almost <coughs> negligible. If you take fossil fuel together, it's almost 60%. And if you take it in India, you see residential energy use is the main one. And agriculture, power production, biomass burning, some natural dust from the Thar Desert, for example, industry and traffic. If you take the uh, fossil fuel together, it's 26%. If you read many reports, also the Lancet report on global health, and many of these reports just mention that because the aerosols are the most important in terms of health, that almost everything is related to fossil fuels. And this is, I believe, not true. It's just a simple assumption 
people haven't really looked very carefully. There are many other sources of particulates that need to be controlled if you want to deal with health, and also climate, by the way. So let me summarize that again. Outdoor air pollution causes respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, leading to 4.5 million premature deaths per year on a global scale. It's mostly in Asia. 75% is in Asia. And this is related to the fact that the population density is high and the pollution density is high. So if you bring these things together. Fossil energy use, if you take them together, is a large source. But actually, residential energy use is eh, from household combustion emissions for heating and cooking is the dominant source category, mostly because it is so prevalent in China and India. And of course, this is, a, this is a source category that also contributes to indoor air pollution. And indoor air pollution is believed to also lead to almost 2 million deaths per year. So that comes on top. There's some overlap, by the way. And then agriculture is important, actually, in Europe and northeastern United States, because not in terms of mass emissions, but in terms of making the particles that uh, uh, influence health. And then uh, the child, childhood, uh, childhood uh, lower respiratory tract infections in lower income countries, they contribute about 5% to attributable deaths. But if you, term, if you translate this into life expectancy, it's 18%. So it's quite a big number, actually. And implementing the WHO guideline, which is 10 micrograms per cubic meter, I think it would be great if that could be achieved. Um, actually, some countries have this as a guideline, like Canada has this as a, as a standard. Australia has even less, 8 micrograms, and the United States, 12. And I think even President Trump is not going to change that. But in Europe, we have 25. So the, the, the standard in Europe is 25 micrograms, which is much, much too high. Because actually, the 10 micrograms is already too high. If you have the 10 microgram, you can, you, can, you can reduce by half. And so further reductions will be needed. So there's a lot of work for you guys to be done to clean up the air and make people healthier. Thanks very much. Time for questions?